Hello and welcome to this special In Conversation event presented alongside this year's Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize finalist exhibition. My name's Claire Needham and I'm one of the curators at Bendigo Art Gallery. Held every two years, the prestigious Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize attracts some of Australia's most exciting and talented artists with the finalist exhibition showcasing the dynamism and diversity of contemporary painting practice today. The winner is awarded a $50,000 cash acquisitive prize and the winning work joins the Bendigo Art Gallery collection. Inaugurated in 2003, the prize was initiated by Mr. Alan Guy to honour his brother Arthur Guy, whose life was tragically cut short while in military service in New Guinea. Thank you for joining us tonight. And please feel free to add a question or a comment via Facebook during the event. There will be a time for questions towards the end. Before I introduce our guests joining me in conversation tonight, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the city of Greater Bendigo, Bendigo Art Gallery, and where I'm joining you from tonight. I'd like to acknowledge the Jar Jar and the Tangarung people of the Eastern Kulin Nations. We pay our respects to their ancestors, elders, past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to all First Nations people who may be watching tonight. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the three artists joining me in conversation tonight to share insights into their work currently on display in the Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize their broader creative practice and their reflections on contemporary painting in Australia today. Renee Cosgrave lives and works in Nam, Melbourne. She's from Eritrea, New Zealand, of Irish, Maori and Scottish descent. Her practice explores painting, wall paintings, rangra, weaving, drawings and prints. Her works investigate colour, repetition, culture and landscape. Bandit Pointong is a contemporary Thai artist who lives and works in Nam, Melbourne. Bundit blends formal training in traditional Thai temple arts with postgraduate study and training in contemporary Western methods and an interest in the contemporary practices of graffiti and pop art to create works in a unique artistic style. Philip Wolfhagen is from Longford, Tasmania and recognised as one of Australia's leading contemporary landscape painters. His paintings are inspired by the atmospheric landscape of Tasmania and the emotive qualities of light and weather. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. I'd like to hand over now to Renee to further introduce herself and her creative practice. Thanks, Claire, and hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the country where I live and work. Um, I live and work on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country here in Nam in Melbourne. Um, and I'd just like to pay my respects to elders and ancestors from lands um, and yeah just also acknowledge the lands where exhibitions on place down the Jawa and Tongarong country and pay my respects to um, the people from those lands. Um, um, so I've just introduced myself to Māori language and acknowledged um, the mountain that I belong to, the waters, um, the chief, the canoe my people came on, um, my tribe, sub-tribe, and myself and just welcome you all. Um, yeah, I wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'm a visual artist in Melbourne, in Nam. Um, and yeah, like Claire said, I create oil paintings, but I've also made some public artworks in the past. Um, prints, drawings, and baranga, Māori weaving, um, and my works um really investigate colour and repetition and talk about Māori concepts such as whakapapa which can translate to genealogy um and talk about 
ancestors as well. Thanks, Claire. Thank you so much, Renee. And we might just start our conversation actually by bringing up an image of your work that's um, in the finalist exhibition of the Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize. So this is a, a piece, a large oil on canvas work. We can just bring up that image to have a look at for everyone. Uh, so I was wondering whether you could maybe just talk about this work and um, the title of the work and how the, I guess, the process of making this work. Uh, yeah. I couldn't see it. Now I can see it. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the work in the Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize is called Toi Darangi, which means line art in Te Reo Māori. Um, and I guess during COVID lockdowns, I, I couldn't paint um, when the studios were closed. And instead, I wrote applications, grants, um, and focused on learning. So. Yeah, I was learning Te Reo Māori language with a group here in Nam um, by Zoom and through that group I was also learning um, Karanga, which is a ceremonial call by Māori women, um, and, and Raranga, so weaving with the School of Māori Art. Um, and when studios reopened, um, basically before before lockdown, I was making these paintings where the palette was um, inspired by the lands of Old Tower. And when I returned to the studio, I didn't feel like making those works anymore. Um, it felt really serious and a bit heavy. Um, and yeah, I started making these paintings with, with lines and picking up random oil colours and applying them to the canvas. Um, that kind of, I don't know. Um, right for me at the time uh, but yeah when I was making the work I could see a very strong relationship between what I've been learning in the class um, in the weaving class and I was really thinking about the fenu, the weaving strips in my weaving and the kind of pace and being relaxed um, while weaving so you have even tension um, and so the work is a line work but very much um, inspired by what I was learning through lockdown through that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, a mentor and a friend uh, John Nixon. Um, a few years ago he came to the studio and he said to me hey, you need painting and putting it in our face. Um, and when he passed away about a year ago and I returned back to the studio, I kind of made this painting because of his advice. Um, so yeah, that was a nice, a nice thing to do for him. Great. Thank you. And there's a real um, vibrancy to this work. So in the exhibition, when you walk into the space, it's right ahead of you um, at the end of the gallery and it just pulsates. It's got this real movement and energy to it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the process you undertook to make the work and whether um, how much of your process is sort of um, spontaneous, I guess, and how much do you premeditate how you'll work with the canvas and the frame of the or the borders of the canvas and the colour? It was really great seeing the work out of my studio and in a big gallery space and being able to step back from it because, yeah, the colours kind of talk to each other and the, it's quite a small brush. So it, I think the kind of wateriness of the paint um, and the small brush marks make the colours kind of move or, um, yeah, when you're standing far away from it. Um, I've forgotten your question already, Claire. Oh, I think uh, <laughs> what was I've just been thinking, question? I guess, about the sort of abstract tradition, and there's lots of different ways that artists work with abstraction. This idea of the kind of you're not necessarily trying to represent anything, but there's this rhythm. But it's also got quite a um, a hand made quality to it. You know, you haven't masked off the lines. You haven't. It's not sort of a hard edge abstraction. You know, you've painted the lines. Some of them are thicker and thinner than each other. You know, they've got this kind of organic quality about them. And then you, they're not grand gestures with a big 
thick brush. It's, you know, very small brush strokes and you've made that very evident. You know, your hand as the artist is very evident in the work. Um, but you can also see there's a real uh, sort of enjoyment of the process of painting um, and making. I'm just interested, I guess, in terms of the thinking about whether it was a planned, you know, you were starting from one side to the other, painting from top to bottom, um, or whether there's quite a sort of spontaneous process or an intuitive process while you're making the work. I think my older works were a bit more spontaneous, but there was always rules or, or a method in my head that helped me to create it. But I used to make works where I would like start using the canvas as a rag and just start to kind of generate marks so that I could build up from that. Um, but the last couple of years I've moved away from that and a lot of my newer works are layer of paint um, and yeah I've had an idea in my mind and then it happened um, I'm not sure what that is but yeah, I, I definitely enjoy the process of making um, and the time um, and labor that goes into painting um, and getting lost in um, and, and a lot of your yeah. works incorporate repetition too don't they so you know it's great that you love that process of making because some of your works particularly those works that kind of expand outside the framework of a canvas and what working on windows and walls and architectural spaces um, but they still had that same approach of sort of method you know methodically repeating a shape or a color or um, sort of this energy that's created across a space. I'm wondering if you could perhaps talk a bit about how you might approach something that's off the canvas um, that you're painting into a, a much sort of larger space that has its own structure through architecture. Yeah, I was thinking about this question and um, I think I've created walls or like I fill up the space until it's filled up. Um, so that the painting become easy <laughs> like in terms of public art um so earlier on i used a projector and then kind of filled in the picture um but then i created simple marks or gestures i could that i could enjoy sort of painting and it wasn't too um i don't know difficult. And how do you choose the colours that you use in your work? Oh, sorry, how do you choose the colours that you use in your work? Yeah, so um, the colours in the toy dye work are random. Um, so it's basically any colour and apply it. Um, but then there's other works where I'm referencing um, places or um, a mountain or waters or, or flowers um, and I think I do that so I don't have to make a decision about it. I just enjoy the making rather than worrying about what was with the spot. <laughs> but they had these these personal connections I guess is sort of infusing so even though um, there's an abstract an abstract um, image that you see in front of you you're not necessarily trying to you know, represent something figuratively or have recognisable elements within it, but sort of infusing um, your own childhood memories or your family or your story, your lived experience into your work through your choice of colour. Yeah, um, for me, things then become about that place or um, it, it's not just an abstract picture. It's um, kind of dedicated to real world yeah would you like to show one of the works we've got an image of a work mother and father would you like to talk a little bit about that yes yeah, so with that work um i was feeling very homesick for aotearoa new zealand um and i started to paint colors from memory from what i remember when i was a kid living there um, so, like, the blues and greens, I guess, could be colours from 
Lake Taupo or the, you know, the forest. Um, and often houses in Aotearoa can be painted this kind of um, aqua, which reminds me of home. Um, and then, yeah, also thinking about orange and peaches um, painted on houses in Aotearoa um, and this kind of like peachy red that my mum would wear in the 80s. So um, I think this was the first work, the first abstract painting I made that um, wasn't just about painting colour but was personal to me and um, talked about home or, yeah, the whenua or land in New Zealand. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And that's a really nice segue actually to bring in um, Bunda into the conversation, speaking about infusing your work with memories of childhood and place and cultural um, motives and symbols and, you know, your work in the Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize is this amazing ecology or community of um, symbols and motives and characters. I wonder if we could bring up Bundit's work, um, Living Room, which is the work that's in the finalist exhibition at Bendigo Art Gallery. There we go. Um, and Bundit, I was wondering whether you could perhaps talk a little bit about um, the title of this work and, um, you know, how it essentially came out of a time, um, you know, you're living in Melbourne, been extended lockdown, spending a lot of time in your living room with your family and all, everything all <laughs> piled in together. I wonder if you could share a bit about how this painting came to be. Yeah. So, so, the, so the, the way I work, the way I work is sometimes I paint first and the titles come after. And then sometimes I, I, I thought about or I think about what story I'm gonna paint. So this this painting, like you see, as the at, the, at my paint, it's all like a different layer and different media and sort of thing. So in this time of lockdown, I guess everyone just spend time together, and I'm, you know, you can't go anywhere. Lockdown and sort of thing, and then just I, I, get, I just remind me of of when. I, in. Uh, I grew up with really big family, and um, from my dad's side, I can say maybe 100 still alive. <laughs> That's what I can say, because of my granddad, my I got uh, seven uncle, and I from that generation, we grow and a kid and so yeah, so yeah. It, kind of you know, living room. So my dad is kind of a living room. So that, that kind of thing warm for me. It kind of really safe, really warm. It's so made what situation to bring up. And where again, when I talk about my artwork like this, it can be a different, different story. It's it than how, how my painting work. So again, because of you know the story um I paint the color for this this painting room. I put the color on the person of the image, and then when sometimes about the image, I think about the color and the story. And so I of me, it it, it really free for me to, to work. And be, and that, how I work. And is it quite a free flowing in terms of this the um, motives or the um, characters that you choose to include in your work? I mean, in our conversations in the lead up to today's event, you talked about you might be listening to some music in the studio and it might, um, you know, uh, make you recall a particular memory or a particular time or person. You know, you might see something during your during your day out and about, and you come back to the studio and you add that into your painting, layering and layering these um, explorations. You're yeah. About, yeah, and yeah, so that again, because when, when I'm painting, when I'm working, you know, like I'm, I'm quite lucky, like I said, I'm quite lucky I'm working in an art uh, framing shop. It's the same, same with like an art community and, you know, you know different artwork and beautiful work, technique, and so like, be like, oh wow, that's a good color. That's a good. It's your, you know, like this day, a lot of artists, you you, you start to and you start to do something. It 
really hard to say that you start you always inspired with something what you really, you know and for myself like it like you, you say in you am a pop art sometime or street art or something or, or some magazine or something what i say that kind of and so so <clears throat> when sometimes listening like you know really really old Thai song and more Thai song like Frank Sinatra I can say like that but it's just like talk the old Thai song they talk about you know a flight there you know okay after we be fine we can have a and then after my office this and this and it's thing hot because uh, the water festival and then all the, all the thing for me it, it so some oh I remember when that bird you sing I just draw the bird sometimes or sometimes oh, say maybe it's say oh today we need pick right right up look, go home together like in a sweet love on a thing right and not go go and go home but you know right buffalo with, together and you know my, my family walk around it it I, it peaceful and then and then when i paint i try to put everything in in square paint like that but the other thing when i paint the, the way and technique i paint i'm not stretching the canvas first i paint i paint and stretching so that kind of make keep me free to paint the air the canvas and then i don't feel like a crop in the square yeah sometimes I paint I set up the canvas on top like a big roll like that. It's like a curtain. I roll on top and roll up and down, up and down to the color dry. That's how it comes freedom for me. And and but when 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 I finish and then I create the new model, you know. Yeah, yeah. And all the music and all sort. Yeah. Of stories, um, and there's so also so many different um, mediums that you've used. This particular work, there's there's pencil, there's spray paint, there's acrylic paint, all of these different um, explorations and plays with medium as well. Um, I wonder if perhaps you could talk a little bit about some of the influences and how you kind of um, choose the medium that you might be working with. Yes, so for me, it, it uh, for my background. My I grew up with uh, my daddy. He he painted a backdrop, like acrylics and uh, all the pigment mixed all the pigment. And, and again, I quite lucky to learn all that technique really young. You know, like I start to I start to paint big board or, or mix the colors. I was ten something. You know, like a real pigment mixed with alcohol, a pure alcohol mixed with blue, and then when when the academy of art learn the, the technique or the medium or the color they paint uh, in a temple a big mirror temple to fix it of the paint it for me it, <clears throat> it's medium i'm not what uh, what can i say like i'm not to stick with what medium i use. i hate like water and oil you can't mix together but you have or like which one is go first which way you know, you if pen oil medium, you can't put a acrylic on top and that it will chew up and something like that. So I, I kind of have a process a little bit. It become naturally from my 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 skill when I learn I was young. And again, sometimes brain is thinking too fast. So I can't wait until pick up the brush or quit. I just write down the pencil <coughs> or oil stick or something like that. So for me it also be, when I went to uni, I did printmaking, so I did etching, lithograph for six year. So when in Thailand, when I went to uni, they do printmaking and painting in the same in the same time, like in the same. You have two subjects in the same time. You you know final year, you, I can separate choose what degree I want to get. I get that kind of technique. It automatically in, in paint something. I scratch like it, it like print making technique, and then again sometimes I need something different on top. 
I will cut a stencil and spray paint stencil. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of also, you know, like conversations in the lead up to this event that your grandfather was a shadow puppet maker. Yep. Yep. There's also those kind so of I, silhouetted yeah, I, influences. Yeah, I, I grew up with with like again, I I grew up with like a, in in a artistic family. So my dad and we really close, and every time you know when he crafts a buffalo to make a shadow puppet or something like that. And that type of uh, experience is always in the back of my mind. So when I came to Melbourne, I like it. Wow, it's amazing. Stencil everywhere. But and bring it to my memory, hey, did we got everywhere in the temple. That is say stencil. Yeah, yeah. So I used to do a bit of stencil in the city. So, but but I'm not going you know, to go out or call myself street art. I bring street art into the gallery. To my canvas, that 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 kind of, you can see the way of artwork as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Bandit. We might now move to Philip Wolfhagen in Tasmania today, joining us. Um, speaking of the alchemy of medium and working with color and um, and different uh, compositions, I guess of uh, or the alchemy of paint, you've crafted over a whole lifetime's career, ways of working um, with paint. I guess um, maybe we could start talking about that as a segue uh, from Bundit, um, about your palette that you um, have refined over those years and the colours that you enjoy working with to create particular qualities in your work. Yes, well, I mean, <clears throat> the, the, you know, paint, colour, the stuff of painting, I mean, that is what really excited excited us all you know from the outset um and i guess it snuck up on me because i actually studied printmaking too uh but largely worked in black and white uh, and um i never considered myself very confident with color but as time has gone on i say the reverse now i feel much more at ease with the color than I do with a pencil and I, I you know I'm going to say I don't draw anymore uh, I just go straight to the painting straight to the table, which is a big slab of, of glass and um, start with my three primaries and a few um, a few secondaries like violets particularly uh, but I find that I can do just about everything with that with that spectral as opposed to a panel palette, so I, I um, my own to start with, which is just made from red, yellow, and blue. And particularly when I'm painting these nocturnes, I find that you can then change when you mix white with that. You can see whether it's a little too violet or a little more yellow or too green or whatever, and you can manipulate. You know exactly what the ingredients are. And it's very easy to sort of modify. Your palette um, for whatever your task you have at a hand. So the particular work that's in the Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize um, finalist exhibition, we might just bring that one up as well, which is called Nearing the Threshold. Um, and speaking of colour and the changing qualities of colour, um, I wonder perhaps if you could uh, talk a little bit about the idea of threshold in terms of the changing um, light that happens between day and night and this point at which um, really excites you about the shifting of light and the phenomenon that happens at that time? Yes, well, it's, um, it's well documented that, you know, we, we have two forms of vision. We have photopic vision, which is our cone receptors in our retina. They perceive colour and scotopic, which are the rod receptors, which um, evaluate tone or, you know, see tone. And so the interesting thing about uh, the cusp of night and day is there's a shift from one uh, form of vision to another, but you still have a little bit of a little bit of colour vision at that time of night. But you start to read tones in an incredibly um, exciting way. I well, exciting to me. So a project nearing the threshold is is just quite a literal allusion to that 
uh, time of the day. But I guess threshold's an interesting concept. Uh, in it, you know, it could be read in other ways. Mm. You know, I could be um, crossing over some 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 barrier into another realm. Uh, yeah, so, the, uh, yeah, I don't know what more to say about that. Um, I mean, I should I should add that in in uh, the 19th century, the, the romantic, the English romantics turned that time of day the painter's hour for the very reason. That beautiful quality of light. Um, and it's interesting yes. too, your, your work um, in terms of your perspective on the landscape um, shifts as well. So this particular work is quite low to the ground. We have a very, um, the horizon line is quite high up in your um, canvas, whereas you do also have a significant body of work of cloud paintings where you, again, <laughs> moving away from that kind of colour quality to the sort of spectrum of, of light. And perhaps maybe you could talk a bit about how that you think about colour in a different way when you're painting those works. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I find that I have these obsessive periods where I can only do work with the one palette and I paint for a year or maybe two years. And uh, at the end of that cycle, you just get so exhausted with the dark that you have this overwhelming desire to just paint light and um, and actually strip your palette right back to almost no colour at all. In fact, my recent cloud uh, from this year's work, you, know, you use mountains and mountains of water paint and the, the you know a tube of yellow and violet and blue you know, hardly hardly um, disappear at all so it's a very economical way of painting um where you know with these dark palettes you know i have to really squeeze out a lot of paint to to get that, that sort of rich depth but yeah so i would say that my, my from one to the other is kind of almost react reactionary. It's just a personal need to cheer myself up uh, after painting all that, all that gloom. I mean, the, the the painting in the exhibition was painted again uh, during lock, the lock, first lockdown, um, and so you know it, uh, it it's it sort of has a sort of a brooding. If it has, if it does have a sort of a brooding mm. quality, I guess that that perhaps contributed it does. to it. Quite a, a poetry as well in in your work. So you paint from observation of the landscape around you. You know, drawing a lot of inspiration from you know the very atmospheric qualities of the Tasmanian landscape. But you're not um, aiming to depict a view in front of you. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about the kind of qualities that you're evoking or the sort of explorations that you're um, doing through your work. Yes, I think that's why I'm so drawn to that alpine uh, landscape here in Tasmania. Is that there's no trees. Um, all the forms are incredibly tight and hunkered down, like even the shrubs are sort of pruned by the wind and... Um, Find that you know you can pare back your your idea of landscape just using these very simple elements of of um, of open space and bushes and stones. I mean, it's, I, I should also say that I'm very um, serious gardener, and I think looking at gardening tradition that has influenced the way I compose if you like, uh, landscapes. The other thing I would say is that. I think we have, well, I should speak to myself. I think, I think I have this blueprint in my mind of what a composition should be. And so when I'm out walking the landscape, that, that recognition occurs when I'm looking at something in the landscape which reflects or matches that blueprint in my mind. And I, so I always, well, we always have a camera in our pocket now, so it's very easy to document and record ideas as you as you're walking if you're even if you're just out for a picnic you know you can grab ideas it's just fantastic uh, to have that ability to, to take those images home and then um, you know work across different sources and 
and come up with something in the studio. And the, I hope that answers the question. It does, it does, yeah. And I'm interested too, perhaps you might be able to talk a little bit about the um, the sort of splitting of that scene. So in your work in the Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize, there's three panels um, of the one scene that's broken apart with a space in between each and that's a device that you have used throughout um, many works across your um, practice. And I'm wondering perhaps whether you could talk yes. a little bit about sort of that break within a scene, um, you're not just looking out a window, you're actually seeing a painting or a representation of a landscape. Yeah, I would say that it probably came to begin with as a, as a device to, to use <clears throat> when I was at still, um, when I was at Sydney College of the Arts, I, were, I mean, I was painting landscape, I was a person painting landscape and people just thought, what the hell are you, you doing? And, uh, and so in order to make it, yeah, I, I started splitting image, you know, within the canvas so that, you know, you just had a scheme of open canvas and often the horizon lines were jolted and uh, so it became a I would say initially it was a device that, that a device, if you like, to, to get around my, my um, tutorials at school um, and then then it became a way of shifting um, uh, perspectives sometimes and of, of also perhaps seeing noting a passage of time. Uh, I mean, you know, when we're in the, in the landscape, we don't see it, a single image of the landscape. We, we're, we're looking at our feet so we don't trip over and then we glance up, we've moved um, a, a few paces before we take in the landscape again. So in some ways it's a more real um, what I've recorded an experience. Uh, and then, of course, the, of course the, this painting is a triptych, so that's a, that's a, um, a, a, a kind of an appropriation of just painting of altar, uh, of altar pieces. And I think I use that really to highlight the viewers, uh, look, to heighten the image and was mine. Like why? Why is the artist? Why does the artist think this is so significant? Um, when it's really just a bunch of brown, rocks, brown lumpy bushes and rocks. Um, you know, it, it's not a. It's not a sort of like misty, craggy, jagged peak that is the sort of more usual romantic idea of landscape mm. to inspire um, or, or um, the sublime. Um, so they're very, it's a very subtle uh, landscape experience that I'm trying to raise up in, in the viewer's mind. Mm. Does that make sense? It does, yep, yeah, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we might bring everyone back into the conversation now and have a bit of a chat between everyone together. Um, it's really great to have three um, dedicated painters with such rigour in their practice and um, you know all of you have explored the medium of paint throughout your practice um, and been quite dedicated to the medium of paint. I wonder whether we might start with Renee again we haven't heard from you for a little while about what you love about painting. Um, I think the thing I like about painting is not being able to describe it in words and um, being able to yeah, like I think with painting, you can digitise it and put it on the website. But really, it's about being with the work. And um, yeah, I have like emotional response to painting um, that, yeah, sometimes I can't describe. Yeah, no, fair enough. Thank you. And Bandit, what do you love about painting? My <clears throat> my painting for this show. Oh, oh. Oh, painting in general what do you love about painting there's definitely a joy in your work of an energy that um you know i imagine you you know have to be in the studio making as yeah uh painting is kind it's kind of i it's kind of meditation for me i guess because i i kind of that person who is full of energy so when i'm working and working and, you know i can't be still and I think it's one thing in painting it, it make me be still 
there and be calm and focus on something for at least, you know, two or three hours. And also, you know, I'm, I'm an early person and I, I get up 4.30 and then pay until 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning and then make a lunch box or whatever. But it, it, it I have that really nice and quiet for me sometime and that kind of, I enjoy the painting and and also my painting is kind of, it, it diary as well for me. And, you know, I like to, like I talk to myself or remind myself a lot in my painting or I forgot something I write down or I, I remember that story and put it in and, and, and yeah, it painting it painting helped me a lot to, to record or get a lot of things of my head. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that kind of you know, kind of make me more relaxed and, and enjoy and, and sometimes I feel like I'm I'm lucky I can paint that, that yeah. And Philip, you trained as a printmaker and um, have tried other modes of painting. You mentioned you've given watercolour and acrylics a go, but you've gone back to oil painting every time. So you could talk a little bit about yes, what you well, love about. The, uh, well, the thing, the thing about painting um, is it's wonderful immediacy. I think that you, you know, but then I, have, I, I have to say that when, you, when things aren't going well in the studio, that immediacy is pretty confronting. You just, all you can see is how, um, how bad you are. <laughs> uh, but, but then you keep going just simply for that amazing feeling um, that when you, when you feel that every, everything you, you're thinking is coming out in front of you in this concrete form. And it's like, it's, well, for us, it's a way of thinking. You know, and, and the thing with painting as opposed to printmaking, um, to bring that back around is printmaking is not immediate. You've got to, you're always working in reverse for one thing and um and you don't, you don't see the result for for days or sometimes even weeks so painting is is a vital language that's what um for me i think that it's like language like the spoken word it's that powerful and it's been um declared as being dead quite a few times throughout art history, <laughs> the advent of photography in the 19th century and conceptual art. But painters keep painting and, you know, we got some really, um, we had a really fabulous array of works that were entered into the Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize this year and seeing the diversity of practice and approaches to painting hanging on the wall in the finalist exhibition is so inspiring. Um, I wonder whether you, one of someone might like to comment or have a... Um, a reflection on, I guess, the place of painting now, particularly in our very digitally, um, you know, mediated lives. Do paintings need to work harder in this digital context? Does anyone have a go at that? Who's going to answer one? that one? <laughs> <laughs> should answer that one. <laughs> Sorry, what what the key key painting? I mean, you mean oh, like thinking painting. about painting in a um, in our very digitally mediated lives, you know, painting um, has been declared dead many times, um, but it keeps on going, and um, you know, artists are constantly reimagining painting and reinvigorating painting, you know, um, reframing the medium and pioneering within the medium. You know, have you talk about its place now in the digital world? Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's the, the painting is it doesn't matter what what going on with this art world you know like uh, uh i'm not i'm not against any technique of the creative artwork right like you know installation or photograph or something but painting it kind of it's simple thing what you think and what you see like a philip said you know it's kind of a language thing sometimes i'm i'm, I'm similar with philip you walk into studio Something. You you don't have to waiting for the process. Something you can paint straight away, and you can work it out after that. You know what I mean? And 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 painting is quite easy thing to create. You know what I mean? For for my it it mistake mistake it, it does matter too much. 
you can fix it. That that sometimes it good painting what I'm thinking. Sometimes good painting it become from mistake. And when you fix, you fighting for your mistake, become good painting. You feel feel good about that. Like you know, for example, <laughs> I don't like green, but every exhibition I challenge myself just paint green first, and then I fix with that. I hate green. Green is not nice. But green is, I think it from thing it green is again from my child life, you know, my childhood life because of when the green come out, golden green or something, it's time to work hard for the right feel because when it's green, become yellow and everything, it's ready to work. So that's why I feel like mm, green is kind of annoying me. But I always challenge with myself and just like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to paint the green painting and work it out. You know, like, again, like a feeling, you know. When we do making or something, and sometimes when you put it, like I agree, you didn't see the process like uh, two weeks, three weeks, and then you print it out, you're like, oh, where did this come from? You have to track back where it mm. when you print it out. I love that. It's a bit painting, like, where did this come from? You know, sometimes, like, oh, what did it happen? Like a, mm. the reflection of something. That the thing, because the painting is easy to fix, easy to start. And, and more enjoyable for me that that's what i'm thinking and you know we are, and another word in my head i'm not going to make a masterpiece so just boy that that's what i would yeah masterpiece everywhere you know you enjoy it and you see what you see you paint what you like to paint that's what i'm thinking yeah yeah mm, I th you you answered that <laughs> very well i think I, th I just think painting is just so such a human, universal human mm. thing to do. Um, mm. Every culture, you know, really has a has a medium that could could be described in these terms. Mm. Um, uh, it just seems to be a very natural um, form of expression. And and Thank I you so much. color, yeah, color is right. Like, you know. So you know, like when you when you give a color to the kid when they paint or something like that, I love it. They just they just pick it up without thinking. You know, mm -hmm. that that kind of thing you like it. Sometimes we miss that when you know a lot of things. You know to play with the color. You oh, you paint a yellow. I put purple in between. It kind of make a vibrant the color of like that. You paint green. You put red, a bit of red, a bit of blue. But when you chuck the painting, the the tube of paint for the kid, it naturally the kid they pick. In with without learning, but they can pick up the pen from the tube with from their feeling. You know what I mean? And and mm -hmm. all the most artists, artists that what I'm thinking, we miss that feeling. Sometimes you just walk in the studio, you're like, I see pen, and then you just start the pen, and then that that kind of grabbing emotion like that, that 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 you know, that similar thing. Never sketch. I just walk in and then see what color I see. Yeah. I I met John Olsen one time, and he said he said to me, uh, he not sketch. He just walk in the studio and whatever color he see first, he just chuck it in. Yeah. That that I quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. The immediacy. Um, yeah. We're just going to open up to some questions now from those who are watching um, in live this evening. So we've got one question that's just come through for Philip. Um, you said your painting has a broody a broodiness to it because it was painted in lockdown. Are you seeing a change in your current works with the world opening up again? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. But I, don't think, I don't think the world is going to open up. There's this sort of, um, I mean, feeling that it's never going to change. That's from where I'm standing. It just seems to... Um, I mean, I just had to go uh, to the general hospital today for an appointment and having to wear masks. And I just think this will never change. Now, now that it started, this will this will just be our lives. And I think the uncertainty is is the thing uh, that is is the most important thing to to take out of this whole uh, COVID experience. We just can't really plan. Mm. Our lives. You just have to get up and see what's happening on the day. Um, I mean, as far as you know, painting goes, it's fantastic because you know you're at home. Uh, there's fewer 
distractions, no travel. So you get a lot more work done. But yes, no, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't have a sense of opening up personally. Yeah. So I know you're about to head into a time where you have a little break from painting over the summer. You mentioned that that's sort of a ritual um, that you have in your practice where you'll have this intense time of painting and then a pause um, for a moment. Is that something that you um, have done regularly as a just a part of your own practice and well-being? I have, I have uh, quite long breaks from painting through the summer period really always because you know that having had a um, young family uh, they've all gone now so uh, that's not so important but you tend to just shut down because it's impossible to concentrate the weather's too nice you go fishing and you know hmm. and hunting all those fun things to do um but no this this year is I, i'm calling it a sabbatical year i'll probably go into the studio and paint um, just because I want to, but I, it's a it's a year of not exhibiting rather than not painting, mm -hmm. and it's and it's an opportunity to do some you know try some different things you know be be a bit more experimental, and it's you know I'm I'm looking forward to not having that sort of expectation like I really have to I really have to finish this because the truck you know the truck is coming at the end of the month and that's that's, <laughs> that's when the paintings have to be done um, and that is a real just a reality of our lives as practicing artists it's a bit like you know performing artists you know they have to just get up and perform at the end of the day <laughs> and that's it yeah lots of reflecting going on this year as well I think about those sort of priorities and um, processes and the, the ways that those sort of um, mechanisms work. And um, I wonder, Renee, perhaps you might like to talk a little bit about your sort of reflections on your work through this time. You've had quite extensive periods of lockdown in Melbourne and, um, you know, you haven't been able to actually get to the studio. And so your kind of way of making that you were used to, all those sort of rhythms um, have been disrupted. And I wonder if that's you know, how that might have impacted or influenced or expanded your practice. Mm, I think um, in some ways lockdown was good. I mean, it was horrible, but, um, you know, I got to focus on other things and um, focus on learning and learning language and we, um, which I probably maybe wouldn't have learnt so much in terms of weaving if I was at the studio because I feel like I should be painting as well. So, um, yeah, it was good to slow down and um, have a have a rethink um, and, and come back to the studio a little bit different. But, um, yeah, I think lockdown has made me want to be more practical and um, sustainable in my practice um, in terms of um, maybe not buying lots of art materials if you don't have any money to do it. <laughs> um, yeah, using canvas instead of linen, just yeah, trying to scale things back a little. Um, I think as a emerging artist, you just make lots of work and are really ambitious and I think, yeah, with lockdown, um, it's made me reflect a little and, um, yeah, just be a bit more sustainable and practical. But I, I got a lot out of lockdown doing that learning. I did miss painting. I, I particularly miss seeing art. And the last two or three weeks I've really enjoyed um, I haven't been to many exhibitions, but the ones that I've been to, I've really got a lot out of it. And it made me realise, like, how important it is being in the community um, and seeing art and, you know, sh sharing conversations. And um, that was really hard in lockdown. It was quite isolating and, um, 
yeah, I really miss seeing other people do that, not just my own. <laughs> That's a great way to end, I think, the conversation um, and to let everyone know that you can actually see the Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize in person in the gallery if you're in Victoria and hopefully from other states very or those that are starting to open up a bit more very soon. Um, are there any more questions? I don't think we've got any other questions coming through. So um, just to let you know that the Arthur Guy Memorial Painting Prize finalist exhibition is on until the 13th of February. Um, and please visit Bendigo Art Gallery's website for um, information about your visit. And you can also on the website see all of the works that are in the finalist exhibition and also vote for your favourite work in the People's Choice Award. Um, a huge thank you to Bundit, Renee and Philip for joining us tonight and sharing really great insights. Thank you and your reflections and feelings about this year. And congratulations on being finalists in this fabulous exhibition. And we thank look you. forward to seeing what you're up to next. And thank you so much for joining us, everybody else listening in tonight as well. And thank you also to um, Bendigo Venue and Events for their production assistance this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.